Hey everyone, I'm Monica Jung and I'm an internal medicine attending at UCLA and today I'm going to be talking about potassium. Hyperkalemia and hypokalemia are very commonly tested topics in medicine. Now you could totally just memorize the list of causes and memorize the treatment algorithm, but to really understand the causes and to understand why we give the treatments that we do, it's important to actually learn potassium regulation. And that's the focus of our video today. So without further ado, let's get started. One important thing to know about potassium is that it's primarily an intracellular ion. So that means there's a lot more potassium inside the cells than outside the cells. Inside the cells, a normal potassium concentration is about 140 milliequivalents per liter. Compare that to the concentration outside the cells in the extracellular fluid, for example, in the blood. So that is about four milliequivalents per liter. So definitely a lot less so potassium is one of those really important ions that plays a large role in determining the cell membrane's resting potential. And it plays a huge role in action potentials as well, specifically in the repolarization phase. So action potentials are super important because that's how signals travel throughout the body. For example, down nerve fibers, muscle fibers, and the cardiac conduction system. So this brings us to clinical problem number one. Since messing with potassium messes with your action potentials, including in the heart and the muscles, it makes sense that the scariest complications of hyperkalemia and hypokalemia are arrhythmias and muscle weakness. So for this reason, derangements in potassium concentration are considered emergencies, particularly hyperkalemia. So if you notice that your patient has hyperkalemia, you better be on it. And in internal medicine, that means power walking to the nearest computer and putting in some orders. If you're wondering why I'm ordering insulin here to treat hyperkalemia, check out the video on the treatment of hyperkalemia. All right guys, so I did the math and a 70 kilogram person would have about 3,920 milliequivalents of potassium inside their cells and only about 59 milliequivalents in their extracellular fluid. But in a normal diet, we take in anywhere between 50 and 200 milliequivalents of potassium a day. So obviously, if our bodies didn't do anything to get rid of that extra potassium, we'd all be walking around with severe hyperkalemia and sudden cardiac death would be happening left and right. So our bodies have to very diligently get rid of this extra potassium that makes it into our blood through the GI tract. And it does this in two ways. So one, it shifts that potassium from the blood into the cells and two, it gets rid of the potassium by excreting it through the kidneys. Let's talk about the first way, transcellular shift. So like I said earlier, the vast majority of the potassium in your body is inside the cells. In fact, 98% of the potassium is inside your cells and only 2% is in your extracellular fluid. So how is the body able to do this? How is it able to segregate potassium so well? It does this using this guy, the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So this pump sends two potassium ions into the cell while it brings three sodium ions out. So it's able to keep the potassium concentration inside the cell high while keeping its concentration outside the cell low. So various things like hormones, adrenergic stimulation, and medications can increase or decrease the activity of this pump. And you can imagine that that would change the potassium concentration in the blood. For example, after you eat, Glucose is absorbed into the blood, then insulin is released from the pancreas, and insulin can increase the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So remember, this pump sends two potassium ions into the cell while it sends three sodium ions out. And so by increasing the activity of this pump, you're sending more potassium from the blood into the cell. So this is how the body manages to control the concentration of potassium in the blood after you take, a, take in a huge potassium load through a meal. So now let's talk about how we actually get rid of potassium from the body. 
So remember, when you're doing transcellular shift, you're just moving potassium from the blood into the cells, meaning you're just moving it between compartments within the body. You're not actually getting rid of it from the body. You can only do this by losing it through the feces or by peeing out through the kidneys. All right, so now we're getting to the good stuff. So quick aside here, I love the kidneys. They're definitely my favorite organ. Because if you can imagine, I mean, it's millions of these tiny nephrons meticulously filtering the blood so that we don't get too acidotic or hyperkalemic or hyponatremic. I mean, it's really, truly amazing. So if you've made it this far in the video, I think you could tell that I'm a pretty terrible artist but I'm pretty proud of this nephron. So let's review the different parts of a nephron. You have the Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending loop of Henle, the thick ascending limb, the distal convoluted tubule, which is not so convoluted in my drawing, and the collecting duct. Part of the nephron is in the cortex of the kidney, and then part of it dips down into the medulla of the kidney. So remember how the nephron works. As the blood travels through the glomerulus, proteins, ions, fluid are filtered out into the tubular lumen of the nephron. And then as this tubular fluid travels through the nephron, different things are happening in different parts of the nephron. So things are either being reabsorbed, meaning brought back into the body, or they're being secreted, so released into the tubular fluid, which eventually leaves your body as urine. So for potassium, 65% of the potassium that makes it into the tubular fluid is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. And then 27% is reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb. In the distal convoluted tubule, there's a change. So the predominant process is not actually reabsorption, but rather secretion of potassium. And then finally, in the collecting duct, only about 4% of the potassium is reabsorbed. So a lot of this step-by-step -step process stays relatively constant, meaning that the proximal convoluted tubule actually pretty consistently will reabsorb about 65% of the potassium that makes it into the tubular fluid. Most of the potassium regulation, meaning adjustment of the concentration of potassium in the blood, is actually happening in the late distal convoluted tubule and the cortical collecting duct, meaning the portion of the collecting duct that's in the renal cortex. Remember that in this section of the nephron, potassium is both secreted and reabsorbed. So this is where the body can really adjust how much potassium we lose in the urine. This segment contains three different types of cells. The principal cell, the type A intercalated cells, and the type B intercalated cells. So let's talk about principal cells first. So here you have a diagram of a principal cell. On the left side, you can see the renal interstitial fluid. So whatever comes out of the cell to this side is going to be kept in the body. On the other side, you have the tubular lumen. So whatever comes out on this side is going to be excreted in the urine. The side of the cell membrane that faces the renal interstitial fluid is referred to as the basolateral membrane. The side that faces the tubular lumen is referred to as the apical membrane. So here's our friend again, the sodium potassium ATPase. It sits in the basolateral membrane. And again, its job is to bring potassium into the cell and send sodium out. So the whole point is to keep the potassium concentration within the cell high. And on the apical membrane, you have two potassium channels, the BK channel and the ROMK channel. So BK stands for, and I'm not kidding, big potassium channel. So someone finally decided to name something, a name that's easy to remember. ROMK, on the other hand, stands for the renal outer medullary potassium channel, but you can remember it as ROMK. So also in the apical membrane is the ENAC channel. So ENAC stands for epithelial sodium channel. And you might be wondering, why am I bringing up the sodium channel? This is a potassium talk. But actually, the ENAC channel plays a huge role in how much potassium is secreted into the tubular lumen. So this is our setup. We have our sodium potassium ATPA sitting in the basolateral membrane. Then we have two potassium channels, the BK channel and the ROMK channel, sitting in the apical membrane. And then we also have the ENAC channel also sitting in the apical membrane. So now let's talk about the step-by-step -step process in terms of how potassium is secreted into the urine. So in the tubular fluid coming down the tubule, you have sodium chloride, sodium ions, and chloride ions. 
Remember, sodium concentration in the cell is low, so sodium has a reason to go through the ENAC channel and enter the cell. So sodium, again, is going from the tubular lumen into the cell. So what's happening to chloride? Chloride is left behind, and chloride is a negatively charged ion. That leaves the lumen relatively electronegative. You're losing the positively charged sodium ions, but leaving the negatively charged chloride ions behind. So why does this matter for potassium? Potassium is a positively charged ion, and it's inside the cell. So it has now an electrical reason to go from inside the cell into the tubular lumen. So potassium now has two reasons to be secreted into the tubular fluid. One, there's a concentration gradient because there's a higher concentration of potassium inside the cell relative to the tubular fluid. And there's an electrical gradient because the tubular lumen is electronegative and that also drives potassium out of the cell into the tubular fluid. All right, so I know that's a little complicated, so let's go through it again. So step one, sodium chloride is coming down the tubular lumen. So you have sodium ions that are positively charged and chloride ions that are negatively charged. Sodium goes through the ENAC channel into the cell. That leaves the tubular lumen electronegative because the chloride ions are left behind. So now potassium has two reasons to go from the cell into the tubular lumen. Because sodium potassium ATPase is keeping the concentration of potassium inside the cell high relative to the tubular fluid, and two, there's an electrical gradient because, again, the tubular lumen is electronegative because sodium ions have moved into the cell. So I won't spend too much time on the intercalated cells because it's really the principal cells that play the biggest role in potassium regulation. But the type A and type B intercalated cells do still play a small role. Type A and type B intercalated cells do opposite things. So the type A intercalated cells reabsorb potassium, meaning they bring potassium back into the body, and then the type B intercalated cells secrete potassium. So their goal is to get rid of potassium from the body. In type A intercalated cells, there's a hydrogen potassium ATPase pump that sits in the apical membrane. And its job is to bring potassium into the cell while sending hydrogen ions out. So this makes sense, right? Because again, type A intercalated cells reabsorb potassium. So they're taking up potassium from the tubular fluid and eventually bringing it back into the body. So type A intercalated cells don't get too involved in potassium regulation unless the potassium concentration in the extracellular fluid is really low because then secretion of potassium is gonna come to a halt and then the type A intercalated cells are gonna play a large role in reabsorbing potassium. In type B intercalated cells, the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump sits in the opposite membrane, the basolateral membrane. So it's bringing potassium ions in while sending hydrogen ions out. So when the potassium ions are brought in, they can then diffuse into the tubular lumen through potassium channels in the apical membrane. So this setup is kind of reminiscent of the setup in principal cells. The intercalated cells mostly play a role in acid-base regulation. Potassium secretion and reabsorption are just side gigs. So quick recap, the distal convolute tubule and the cortical collecting duct contain three types of cells that play a large role in potassium regulation. That's the principal cell and the type A and type B intercalated cells. Remember that the principal cell is the one that plays the biggest role. So we've talked about the bits and pieces of potassium regulation, but now it's time to put it all together. Let's say we're trying to lower the concentration of potassium in the blood. So what has to happen? Potassium needs to move into the cells and the kidneys need to increase secretion of potassium into the urine and decrease reabsorption. So what triggers all these processes? Three things, an increase in plasma potassium concentration or the intake of potassium itself, aldosterone secretion, and an increase in the delivery of water and sodium to the distal convoluted tubule and the cortical collecting duct. So let's go through these one by one and talk about how each of them leads to a decrease in potassium concentration. So number one, an increase in plasma potassium concentration by itself actually triggers a bunch of different processes. So first, it actually stimulates the sodium potassium ATPase pump so the cells take up more potassium. And an increase in the concentration of potassium in the plasma 
also means an increase in potassium concentration in the renal interstitial fluid. And that actually decreases the concentration gradient of potassium so that there's less backwash of potassium from the tubular fluid back into the body. And finally, the increase of concentration of potassium in the plasma also directly triggers its synthesis of more potassium channels, namely the ROMK channel and the BK channel. Number two, there's aldosterone, which we all know well from the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So when we all think of aldosterone, we tend to think of its role in increasing sodium reabsorption. But it also indirectly increases potassium excretion, which lowers the concentration of potassium in the blood. So it's very multi-talented. But there's more. Aldosterone also stimulates and increases the number of sodium potassium ATPase pumps in the basal lateral membrane of the principal cell. And it also increases the number of potassium channels in the apical membrane of the principal cell. So like I said, very multi-talented. Now it's time for clinical pearl number two. Now that we know that aldosterone lowers potassium concentration by increasing its secretion, it makes sense that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers, which ultimately lower aldosterone levels, can cause hyperkalemia. Decreasing aldosterone means decreasing potassium secretion, thereby increasing the concentration of potassium in the serum. Finally, number three, increased delivery of sodium and water to the distal convolute tubule and the collecting duct increases potassium secretion. So this one sounds fancy, but if you understood how the principal cell works, then it's actually not a hard concept to grasp. So remember that as sodium gets to the distal convolute tubule, it moves through ENAC channels into the principal cells, and eventually potassium is secreted through the ROMK and BK channels into the tubular lumen to be excreted in the urine. So it makes sense that the more sodium you have coming through, the more potassium you're gonna send out. And of course, excreting more potassium is going to lower your body's potassium levels. So there you have it, a short summary of potassium regulation. If you want to learn more about potassium, be sure to check out my other videos on the causes of hyperkalemia and the treatment of hyperkalemia. Thank you guys again so much for watching. Take care and see you next time.